Alright, let's get started. This is by Nosy, <laughs> um, and he or she are, is having problems uh, with making the nose look slim and feminine. Now, um, the difference between a feminine nose and a masculine nose, um, you know, by how, like, uh, just in the, in the, uh, what's the word for it? In the most basic sense, let's just use that word, it is the difference between a sharper, sharper edges and softer edges. The softer edges, um, for females, are found generally in the tip of the nose and the shape of the nostrils. Masculine noses tend to have a sharper bridge. And I'm basically talking like, I'm not talking like I've seen every face in the world, but I am talking like um, I've seen every illustrated face. <laughs> not every, but I've seen enough illustrated faces of male and female, you know, for like game design and stuff. Usually the man has a slighter, lar slightly larger nose. Um, than the female, because remember the cute look is the two large eyes, small nose, and small mouth. Um, but for men, it's usually the mouth and the eyes and the nose all have pretty proportionate measurements. So let's see the difference between this guy's nose here, which has sharper edges on the sides. And you can find a woman with this kind of nose. But generally speaking, they are a bit larger and a bit more um, pronounced. The tip is usually much sharper. You see this tip here that I call um, the wife, usually in the <laughs> in the well, such a stupid tutorial. But um, but in the nose tutorial, um, the the edges are a lot sharper, a lot more geometric. So what you want to do when you paint female p pictures, uh, female faces, is remember to maintain that soft look. Okay. So let's see here. This one looks a bit masculine. So what you do here to make it look a bit more feminine is just um, try to bring them together in one big unit instead of having them droop downward, which is it can have can happen with a female's nose. But what you want to do is make it as close to a baby's face as possible without making it look like a baby. So still adding that elongated. Um, elongated nose bridge, still having the tip protrude, still having pronounced nostrils, but enough that you aren't entering the masculine um, definitions of a nose. Okay, so that said, we just sort of fixed the proportions a little bit before they were a bit more uh, down pointed, the pointing down, so if you were to see it from the side it'd be pointing downward. And we sort of fixed it to, to look a little different. So before it was sort of pointing downward, now it's pointing this way. And that's pretty much it with female fa female noses, especially if you want to paint pretty female girls for like games and stuff later on. Um, what you want to do is maintain a more, um, get, get your look going, get the habits, get the, get the you look of the face going. So what I mean is there's a, there's a kind of nose that's, the nose I always paint, and if I ever want to paint a pretty girl, I know exactly what kind of nose to use, what kind of mouth, and what kind of eyes. And that's something I want you to sort of eventually discover, the pretty face, the very standard face that you can ma make without using a reference. However, when you do use a reference, you have to notice and create a likeness to the reference that you're using. So you have to always make sure that you're measuring properly, but generally for a female nose, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty um, concrete the uh, the measurements involved in it, which are everything is pretty, um, and the nostrils aren't much larger than the than the center of the nose. It is generally very symmetrical. The bridge of the nose isn't broken. It isn't cro uh, crooked. It isn't going to one side. It is still um, symmetrical, and the bridge isn't too wide. It isn't wider than the mouth is. It isn't wider than the eyes are. It's generally very balanced. So this square, this measurement here, would be the horizontal measurement of the eyes and the mouth, and then you have the triangle of cuteness. If you want to make a non-cute person, you just invert the triangle, smaller eyes, large nose, and larger mouth, and legs and arms. Okay? So, excuse me one second.
Okay. So let me just back up on these. Damn it. <laughs> what am I doing? Okay. So, as for the stroking part, um, I mean the brush strokes or the lighting, what you need to do is establish a light source for all of these studies here. So all of these studies should have a light source that's pointing from the top, okay? And that way you know where to cast the shadow. So all these shadows that you're casting here are pretty um, undefined, and they seem to be pretty wonky. What you need to do is find that high point of the nose. And the high point of the nose is the highest point of the face. Now look at any profile picture or painting, you'll notice that the nose sticks out the furthest of all of the features of the face. And so that means that it will be exposed the most to the light. Okay, and don't pronounce the sides of the nose too much. This bridge area, it's 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 overrated this amount of, of shading it's been getting. Um, what you need to do is just blend it in and make it a gradual rise, like a gradual. It's just a hill, it's not a mountain. So there doesn't need to be major shadows cast on either side, and it's not like it's a really sharp edge here. If those kinds of shadows here happened, it means that this edge here, if we were to place a contour line over it, just like this, it would be a pure edge meaning that this edge here is actually like this from the side and then you have the nostrils. This is wrong. And this can happen in real life, though the, the sides are a bit rounded off and this is for masculine features and this is what I mean by geometric for masculine noses. They're a bit more pronounced, a bit more bony. Okay, and the sides of the nose is just like I've taught you guys. I do recommend if you are taking on these nose studies after you've done a decent amount of nose studies, mouth studies, eye studies, I uh, recommend you do the 14 day challenge um, and practice full on face. It will really will, it will change everything. That, all the mumbo jumbo you used to have trouble with painting a full on face. If you take it down and break it into separate studies and then unify it again as a face later on, you'll find that everything is so much more easy nostrils here okay and that's pretty much it and as for the kinds of strokes you want to use um, if you want to paint a female face um, and you want to make the face look like it has no blemishes it's very beautiful maybe you're painting some sort of ice princess or something um, use a soft brush um, for blending the skin. You can use a hard brush for establishing basic colors and texture, but if you want to finish it, you want to have a finished look, you need to use a soft brush. Okay? And uh, follow that video that I posted up on how to paint noses if you ever get lost and how to shade a nose or nostril. Uh, follow that video. Pretty much everything I'm doing right now in front of you is explained there. I'm just really softening up the edges, finding the high points of the nose. So high point here, high point here, and high point here, and blending. And the way I blend is I just use the drop tool, as you guys can see. Okay, I've taught you why I placed this light source here under the tip of the nose. It's just reflected light from the lips. I've explained already how to, why the nose shadow happens. So all of this is available to you guys online right now. It's not something that I am not explaining very well to you. <laughs> okay? And um, of course, like I always say, don't use black too soon. One of the nostrils are a dark spot. Um, so you have to be careful which, which, where you place this dark spot here because you don't want to lose what you just painted. You don't want to lose all the, the nice shades you just in the blending that you just did, but you also don't want to make it look undefined. Something undefined doesn't have very good edges. Um, edges are part of why we paint realistically and not use lines. Lines are um, the 2D way of using edges or making edges is using lines. But when you're not using lines and you want to color realistically, you have to let go of the lines and start bringing in the edges. And the edges happen 
by using a really hard brush on the edge and you stop using the soft brush, you stop blending. Over blending makes you lose form. Not enough blending also makes you lose form, but you get my point. I hope. So her nostrils do look a bit pronounced. If you want to bring them down a little bit, make them less outward, you just decrease the light source that's that's um, reaching them because they're not sticking out that much, therefore less light. And that's really it. It's just a relationship between what is exposed to light and what isn't. What's exposed to light sticks out more, therefore has more light on it. There's a lighter value. You use a lighter value to shade it. Okay. Okay, so I'll show you in a second before and after. Save. So do you get what I'm say what I'm doing here, um, nosy? <clears throat> I basically changed the the measurements of the nose. So what I did, what you had before, was a nose that was a bit masculine. It was it wasn't that masculine. It was it was pretty uh, feminine around the around the edges. See the nostrils are pretty feminine. Um, for instance, this here is a bit masculine, this here is a bit masculine. And some women do, in the real world, have masculine noses, and um, they don't have a feminine nose or a traditional beautiful nose. And the reason why um, in this image it isn't a feminine nose is because of the tip. It's downward, it's dragging down. What I did was push the tip upward. And I know I painted a bit, a bit soft, and I'm sorry if you guys don't like the soft way I paint things, but... Um, But I pushed the nose up, I softened the edges, and I found the light source. It's the most important thing. I mean, I'm telling you guys about measurements and Bob and Steve, but I'm, I'm, I'm being really serious when I say, you can't have a nose if you don't have a light that reveals that nose. And if you have the light, you can have the volume of the nose. You can have the volumetric uh, uh, girth of the nose there sticking out, causing a shadow to, to be cast on the face. It's very, very imperative that you guys remember the light source. If you don't have a light source, you don't have a nose. You don't have anything. You have a dark room. You have a blind person that can't see anything. That's basically it. Remember that. It's the most important thing. If you take anything away today into your room studies, into your next studies, while you're studying there in your room, remember that it's the light source that's the most important thing. Okay? So I'll save this and send it back to you. Um, how would you like me to send it back to you? Are you on my Skype? If you aren't, please add me so that I could send it to you. I might not be able to add you guys to the, to the chat group, but you can still be on my chat li um, on my list so that I can announce and all that stuff. So you guys will feel free to add my Skype. One second. Okay. Um, now this one. Uh, right off the bat, I think some of you already know, um, you're using darks too soon. You're using too much dark too soon. Um, it's a really dark image and there's high contrast, and if there's high contrast, um, uh, there's going to be a problem. Uh, if we don't have Skype, can you upload it anywhere? Um, I haven't uploaded, like I haven't, I haven't ever done that for anybody. Usually people are like right on it to add my Skype, but... I guess I can work something out where I can upload it for you guys somewhere. Maybe on the class website on one tab or something. <clears throat> okay? Okay. So let me see if um, anybody... Okay. Alright, so for this one. Um, you are in a stage where you are still learning how to paint a face. And I do not recommend, because you are on this, um, basically you're doing 14 day challenges quality face right now. So I do not recommend trying to make a painting out of every little painting that you do. Like trying to make a finished quality um, portrait for your portfolio. I don't recommend that. I don't recommend adding hair. I don't recommend adding any props. <clears throat> There's a reason why I say don't add hair, don't add necklaces don't add any props to the 14-day challenge. Uh, the reason why I say that is because it is not important yet. 
The most important thing is learning how to paint a face well, and then adding the props later, and then finding a tutorial, separate tutorial for how to paint hair, separate tutorial for how to make a prop or how to make a necklace, um, and all that stuff. You are still early in your um, in your art endeavors, so I do not recommend working on or trying to make a finished piece out of every little hour you spend on your computer. You're not going to get portfolio ready finished pieces right away. So don't expect that. Because if you expect it, you're going to be disappointed because there's always going to be a problem. Portfolio pieces usually have to represent like your most exemplary level of understanding um, of, in art. And these, you have not yet learned enough to, to, be, to be worried about that yet. So for now, I recommend you learn how to paint a face really, really just well and then add in the um, and then add in the props and you are pretty good you are getting the basic structure of a nose you are getting the basic structure of an eye uh, the only issue is I don't see enough work done on all these separate features separately so what we just saw with nosy he's doing separate um, nose studies or she um, and that's really good because you're breaking down the learning energy into one or focusing the learning energy of that day that you have, that one hour you want to spend or two on one subject of study. It means you're going to learn that subject of study like in the most optimal way. Um, and that's what I recommend you do. I recommend you do a separate eye study, a separate nose study, a separate lip study, and then combine them together to make a beautiful face later on. You're you haven't yet learned how to paint like a mature face or an, el an older person's face to be worried about painting younger people. Usually get the thing that gets you paid learned right away. Um, that's sort of the rule of thumb here. Learn how to make a, a character illustration in case you need to get paid later on because you do spend a lot of time on your art. Most likely you want to get paid for it later. This is something that you're, is a life pursuit. So learn something that you can get paid for right away. And that thing is paint a woman's face. Learn how to paint a woman's face. Take it from me. It's going to get you paid. <clears throat> At least from my experience. Um, so learn all the basic measurements and all of that stuff. And it's really not much that I've done for this face right now. I've just realigned the features to be a bit more attractive. Um, the distance between the nose and the mouth was too much, and that made the face look older, but the eye size made it look like a baby's face. Um, and people do have these measurements in their faces sometimes, but um, again, in the world of art, you don't want to just be able to paint random stuff. You want to perfect one field and really just make it your own. And I recommend, if you're early on and you haven't yet started your, your art career, to learn how to paint a, f a woman's face. Usually those are the most popular things and those will get your recognition. And then separately, after learning how to paint a woman's face, you automatically learn how to paint a man's face because you just have to break all the rules of a woman's face. You have to invert the triangle a little bit. You have to enlarge some of the features and you have to um, make the, the brows heavier or the brow bone heavier, the eyes smaller, the nose more um, muscular, I guess, and the lips wider. And, and out of that, you just you just soar. You just learn how to paint hair. You learn how to paint props. But for now, I really recommend you perfect how to paint a face. Look at references. Find an artist that you really admire, and um, use them as inspiration. Imitate them. Take from them a little bit, and then go on to another artist until you develop your own specific way of painting a face. Okay? For whoever sent me this, I'm sorry. I'm not sure um, who sent it. <clears throat> hey, Ario. Okay, so let me go on Mattia's picture. Okay, Mattia. Um, he's not with us, but he's going to be he's going to be looking at the um, uh, recording. So, Mattia, let me do something here to show you what's wrong with the image. Okay. So when you're working with this much detail and you're trying to make portfolio stuff, you're trying to get paid, you get into this tunnel vision, this rendering, this, this evil tunnel vision that is a result of rendering too much or working too much with detail, um, not zooming out enough. Not zooming out enough means that you're going to miss some issues, some measurement issues. So this is basically what I see. 
Um, I see a head that's too big. Let's forget the face for a second. That's why I erase the face. I see a head that's too big for the body. Okay. I see a shoulder that's too big for the head. I see breasts that are not aligned. This happens a lot in your paintings, Mattia. You don't think about the symmetry line, not just on the face, but everywhere else on the body. If these breasts are, if you were to look at the face straight, they're equal and they're symmetrical, it means they have to stay symmetrical at a separate angle. For what you've done, you've placed the breasts in a way that looks like we're looking at them straight on, even though she is clearly on a three-quarter view. Let me zoom out a little more. Um, the thigh here is a bit off. She has to be really twisting the thigh like intensely to get to get that to get that look. Her foot must be just really uncomfortable or she just entered a pivot. In order to have a stable stance, she's going to have to have her leg facing this way, so this direction. But right now it's facing the opposite direction, which is what's making this position or this stance so awkward. Um, when you render a lot, you render too much before investing enough time into the figure, what happens is that these problems show up after doing this much work. So Matias work right now, see it as a cautionary tale. When you don't um, uh, when you don't think about the basic fundamentals early on and get them out of the way, they will come to haunt you. They will come back to haunt you when you're rendering in your rendering stage. And that's never a good thing. Okay, so let me show the face one more time. Do you see how off the face was? It was too large. It was out of place completely. It was like a cut and paste. Like you painted the body and then you brought in the face that you painted in another image and you put it in there. It looked cut and paste. Even though you might have painted it at the same time, um, what, what, might have, what looks like happened is that you cut it, cut it out and pasted it tried to make it fit into the angle. That's what happens when you guys don't think about symmetry and think about the fundamentals early on. Okay, as for the leg here, I can just completely um, let's see, flip horizontal. I can completely do this. Just completely flip it. Now what happens with when you render a lot and someone comes out and tells you after all that work you just put in that you did it wrong? I'm, I don't blame you if you get pissed. I don't blame you if, if you're frustrated. But this is how this is the game of art. You have to learn. You have to know what you're doing. And if when you're going to be entering that tunnel vision of rendering sometime in the future, after you've done enough work on the image, you're gonna have you're gonna face some problems. And these are some of the problems, these these major photo manipulation things that I'm doing right now. This is a problem. This shouldn't be happening because these things should have been taken care of early on. And these are the things that you suffer from. It's not your ability to render a lens flare or place in fire right or texture or balance all the colors and contrast. It's really not what's the problem here. The problem is that you are neglecting to use the symmetry rules. You are neglecting the basic rules of anatomy um, that you should be focusing on in the gesture study early on. You should do four or five gestures practicing her gesture and her and her stance before you enter rendering mode, before you enter absolute illustration. Um, this this is a common rule and you should start doing that, Matia. You should start practicing in four or five studies or so the gesture that you're going to be working on, get some feedback on it. Is this a good texture, right, uh, um, gesture? Right now, all this seems like extraneous and unnecessary to you. It might sound unnecessary, might sound like a waste of time, but where is the waste of time early on when you're practicing something that you're going to be illustrating to the T? Or later on after you're done uh, rendering like crazy and you find that you have proportion issues, you find that you have anatomy issues. This is something that you should be avoiding. This is this shouldn't be happening if you're at an understanding of of contrast enough that you're at this point in in in, in illustration level. This is good. This is really good work. And you're you, unfortunately you're being um, dragged down by the fact that you neglected 
the, the, the gesture study and the figure drawings. You need to do more figure drawings, Mattia. You need to practice more on the female figure. Learn about weight distribution. Learn about um, what happens when, when one leg leans on the other, what happens to the hips, what happens to the shoulders. All of that stuff is necessary, really necessary, especially if you're rendering realistically, especially if you're painting realistically. Everything is going to show a hundred times more. It's like putting a magnifying glass on your problems. It's going to show because you're going to be painting them realistically. You can get away with anatomy problems with a sketch, but when you start shading, that's when they really show up, when something is a bit too large. It just looks wrong. Okay? And for the face, if you want to place it in right, you're going to have to shrink it. And raise it up a little bit. And one of the problems here, one of the biggest problems, is the hairline. And the way you painted the hair. The hairline isn't that defined if she's bald. In that area, it's a bit more of a it's a bit more of an undefined area. The hair doesn't grow in that straight a line. There's smaller hairs, uh, thinner hairs in the front. Also, you need to desaturate the area of the hair here that is hairless. So her forehead or her her bold head here. What happens is that there's a very green or purpley look that happens to the head when it's bald in one area. <clears throat> Another problem is that this face right now looks like a cutout mainly because there's no real light source for her face area that's revealing her face. There's no real light source. You have to figure out where the main light source is. And again, this is another one of those really important rules that you are neglecting. Determining your light source is the most important thing, probably the most useful thing you can do for your painting. For yourself, really, as an artist. Because everything that we see, can everyone agree with me on this? Everyone, Everything that we see is because there's a light that's revealing it to us. If that's difficult to understand, then you need to rethink um, how you understand light sources altogether. <clears throat> yes, I am doing paint overs right now. Critique paint overs. Okay, and so let's establish that there's some sort of light source coming in from this area here. By the way, welcome. Welcome, Janalu. Um, Let's rearrange the details of her face to, or the, the lighting of her face to be a bit more responsive to a light source or something. Also proportions of a face, symmetry of a face, all of that stuff, really, really important. Okay, now her face seems to be fitting on to her head a little bit better. Um, as for the mohawk, it needs to sit on the curvature of her skull if you want to make it like a mohawk like that. So it can't be all the way down here because the skull is, is shaped spherically, so it has to follow that spherical cranial surface. And because there are thinner hairs at the front and thicker hairs at the back, the red, the saturated red, doesn't go all the way down here. That makes it look like a wig. If you want to make it look real and not like a wig, what you do is you blend some of the skin tone into the hairline. That's a really good tool for some of you here who want to paint hair on the face directly. You guys have that sort of wig look to the hair that you draw, even though it's not a wig. It's because you forget to blend in the skin and the hair and the hairline. This is the hairline area right here. Blend the skin and the hair a little bit so it doesn't look like a wig. A wig obviously doesn't blend with the skin because um, the hair isn't on the skin. The hair is separate. It's an attachment. Okay. 
still rearranging some of these features. It still looks off to me. I will flip the canvas in a second to help me out. the canvas so it's a lighting problem. This area here is dark. This area here isn't. It's really important that you guys remember to use your light sources. Remember the fundamentals. Fund what are fundamentals? This is rec. Fundamentals are if there's a light, if there's a light, there will be a shadow. If you're using colors, use the color wheel as a guide. If you're doing anatomy, look to actual anatomy. Don't imagine it. Don't think about the anatomy in your brain because that's always a symbolic misrepresentation of what anatomy is in real life. I'm not expecting any of you to have a photographic um, memory. If you want to paint something anatomically that's anatomically correct, you have to look at things that have anatomy and use a reference. I'm not expecting you, any of you here, to memorize right away. And nobody is expecting it. Everyone studies. And there's no shame in looking at a reference. What else is, is proportion? I mean, um, fundamentals. Form. Form is part of the fundamentals. Contrast um, happens <clears throat> to reveal more, uh, cl the closer you, you are to, an ob to the light source, the more contrast that happens in the object's form. Um, Composition is one of the things that you need to focus on um, as well, the way to, to, to stage your painting. All of that stuff is really, really important. And none of you should be ignoring it because it happens in real life. Okay, all the proportion issues are with the breasts here. The distant shoulder over here. I fixed the leg to be more... Um, sort of in proportion. And that's pretty much all I can do right now. I hope it helps. Uh, let me just do a little bit more on the head. Okay. And if there is, this is like a, another thing that happens as well in the painting that's troublesome when you want to include atmosphere. Actually, one second, please. When you want to include um, atmosphere uh, and you want to make it look realistic, uh, what you have here is you have an atmosphere in the back here, Matia. It's atmospheric fade going on. It's really gradual. It's really well done. Uh, what you need to do also is if there's atmosphere there's air and if there's air there's wind there's wind currents and you're representing a wind current here right here which seems completely out of place it seems just like a dramatic addition it's like a prop instead of an actual phenomenon and a natural phenomenon that's happening which is wind but this wind isn't affecting the fire here isn't affecting the fire here isn't affecting the fire here these are just stamps that you've used that are not that are causing you a problem. Either you get rid of her hair in that way um, and make it just hang on her side or just be reacting to her movement. So wherever she's going, or the wind is going, or the hair is going with her instead of a wind like this. If she just did move and her hair is still trailing behind her, so would the fire. If that wasn't a wind, if that was movement trail or motion trail. So rethink this. Um, and uh, I think you shouldn't paint a face and then bring it in and hope it works if you painted the face separately or you painted the face first and then everything else just came after you so you painted an eye you're like hmm this eye looks good let me paint another eye hmm these two eyes look awesome let me paint a nose hmm okay let me add a head hmm let me add a body you're not thinking about um, gesture this way you're not thinking, you're not planning this way, you're just going with the flow, and what happens when you go with the flow like that without planning is it's so much easier for you to make mistakes. Even if you know better than to make those mistakes, you make them accidentally, because you haven't planned it, okay?
This is why contractors, when they're making a, a shed or they're making some sort of deck for the back of your house or something, they use ropes. Using the ropes helps you, um, uh, or the strings, you know, the strings helps you know where to place down the bricks of your house. Um, that's why you see strings everywhere, because if you do place the bricks down very, very well, um, uh, I learned this from a Proco video actually. So he brought it on an artist uh, guest to talk to you to talk about it, and he made such an amazing point. Without the strings, we don't have um, a straight finish with the work that we're doing. The strings are s ex exactly equivalent to the gesture lines. If you don't have the gesture lines, you don't have any guiding points. And what's going to happen is um, you're going to it's going to be obvious where your problems are. These are not equal, meaning the wind isn't affecting the both here. Let me just add the wind. Okay, so I hope that helps you, Mitzia. Um, let me just show you the before and after. Before, do you see how large the head was? How off the face was? How disproportionate the boobs were? So if you were to look at her from face on, if she was facing you directly, straight symmetrically one boob would be lower than the other this boob would be lower than this boob her leg is completely off to the side um, uh, you've tried to make everything render perfectly and at the same level but what happens is um, you over render and then you forget to zoom out and see these problems beforehand after I shrunk the head a little bit realign the breast but there's still issues because essentially the, the pose is too stiff because you hadn't practiced the gestures beforehand. It's really important for you to practice the gestures. Okay, and that's it for this one. Cancel, flatten, yes. Okay, here's another painting. Um, so I can't really paint over this one because many reasons. Main reason is the saturation. There's a lot of saturation here. And the saturation is beautiful. It's a very beautiful thing to look at. Colors this uh, bright and vivid are very pretty to look at. They work well in a painting. However, colors like that are a stylistic choice. What happens with style is you have to have the realism before you have the style. If you have just style, you're just going to have abstract. And abstract, I'm pretty sure, isn't what you're trying to paint. You're going to have to have the realism to back up the style and reinforce the style. Um, do you guys know what I mean when I say reinforce the style? Uh, in order for something to look like it's off, it has to be right first. So if you want to paint a face that's a little bit off, if some, I'm sure you've seen those artists that paint faces that are a little bit off, the nose is long and the lips are really small and the head is really long, but the eyes are so well painted it looks realistic, but the face is off a little bit. The reason why it's effective style, it looks really pretty, is because they have the realism intact and they've messed around and broken some rules and then they got the style. Oversaturation is a stylistic tool. This is style right here. This is style in action. However, this is an actual form. This is a boat. This is the you know foliage. This is sand. This is the shore. This is a horizon line. There's a lot of things here that need definition that require realism first. So what do you do first to establish a landscape? You always have to have your um, horizon line. If you have your horizon line, you need perspective, which means vanishing points, etc. So let's say this is a one point perspective, just for the sake of the critique. We need to establish our surface area. Is the boat sitting on that surface area? Is the angle correct? Um, is the foliage sticking out a little bit? Seems out of place. Seems like cut and paste because look at the orange and then look at the green. They're just completely tackling each other in this. So at which point here should you have? What what should you have done? You should have started with realism first. Found a good reference. Found all of these um, major points of realism here, which is the horizon line, perspective, etc. And then, when, when you were done with the basic sketch and the basic lines, what you do is you stylize. Now, let me show you someone who does this a lot. And he's one of my favorite artists ever. <clears throat> he's, his name is Theo Prinz. I'm sure you guys have know, know about him. 
he establishes the, the, the realism, he establishes where it's needed actually, he establishes form, atmospheric fade, he establishes scale, scale is one big thing that you guys have to remember in painting landscapes. So the atmospheric fade, so the lack of saturation in the back versus the saturation in the foreground, same with here. He breaks a lot of rules of realism, but what happens is it works. Why? Because he has the realism reinforcing the non-realism, which is all of this crazy mess. I mean, at the end of the day, for the untrained eye, it just looks like uh, abstract painting. If you guys want to see his work, it's over here. Let me link it. This is what happens when you know enough about realism. Look at this low horizon line and these large vertical scales. This is all important. It's not something that you can ignore. It's not something that you... Realism isn't something that you can ignore at all. Okay? And you need it if you want to make a stylistic um, deviation. Not deviation as in DVNR. <laughs> deviation as in a movement away. To deviate away from the rules of realism. You have to have realism first. Okay? I'm sorry. I'm really passionate. Imagine I'm grabbing you all by the shoulders and just shaking the hell out of you guys. Please. I really need um, you guys to remember that it's, it's not me sitting here teaching you new rules of life and my um, methods of, of, of being the best artist. I, I'm not the best artist in the world, therefore I don't have the best tips ever. All I know is I know who the best artist in the world is, and that's nature, or God, or whoever you believe in. And they did it right, so we're just trying to copy them. However, the variation, our... Um, our our uniqueness is in the way we break this, these rules and create style. So I can't critique this for you. There is no paint over here. I can't paint over this because there's too much work to be done. Meaning the realism. There needs to be a there needs to be a reference. There needs to be um, all these line all this line work. What I can do is point you in the right direction. So I'm pointing you right now to find a reference. You have a really 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 good eye for 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 color. I love the way the red remained red here, and then it tr turned into the orange, and then it entered the yellow. I see a lot of just yellow and red instead of this beautiful graduation here. This gradual movement here, just let's focus on this beautiful. I just love color so much. This just this this movement into the orange. This is this takes an eye to accomplish this, and not just that, but the movement into the blue, and the blue into the navy. Higher and higher. Do you see this? This is all. This all comes, it's an instinct built in you for color. You have an eye for color. Whoever painted this, um, Saki MJ, <clears throat> or MG. Um, so don't take it as you not knowing how to draw. You know how to draw. You know how to color. You have an eye for it. However, what I need you to do is empower that knowledge for color that you have with some realism. Okay? <laughs> I did. I should. I woke you up. I bet you're sleepy right now. It's 3 a.m. or something for you. <clears throat> Pi, you can do it, okay? And if you need, if you need some sort of um, help, if you need tips and tricks, there's this community. These 24 people here today. Imagine this is a classroom. If we, all of us were here together today, we'd fill in a classroom, a, an actual university room. So, um, wow, it's nearly four. I'm so sorry. So you, you can ask all of us, just three people in your life who are good or, or, or do art is enough to improve you. Um, my art circle group when I was growing up was like two people, one person sometimes. And it was just back and forth critiquing each other till we got better. Um, you have 24 people here who you can get to know very well. There's also a group on, on Facebook and everywhere else. And what you can do is upload your images. Tell me, guys, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this image? But now I'm telling you spot on what you could be doing, Pi. And it, it is finding a reference, getting the good lines down, good lines, good reference, um, good perspective, good fade, um, good form on the structures, like the mechanical structures, like a boat good form on the uh, foliage or organic structures like the, like the leaves here and then throw on some beautiful colors and then just go crazy you know go crazy with your colors okay and if you want to add my Skype to get to me directly add my Skype here 
Okay, you always need a good background with realism and fundamentals in art. You always need a good background on that. And the only way to get that is observation. <clears throat> yes, so I'll, no saving on that one. So this is by Carlo Marcello, our own celebrity. He's a very, very good artist. Um, and um, he's asked me to critique this. So I'm not really sure what I should be critiquing because it would be me breaking his style. He's got a good hold over his realism. So do you see what I'm talking about? The realism is here. The style break is here. And this is what makes Marcello, or Mar Mar Carlo Marcello, Carlo Marcello, is this habit he's been developing here, this, this stroking, this dabbing technique. And he's going to keep developing this more and more until it becomes something amazing. You guys see how he signed his name here? Like, it seems like it's part of the dec decor, or like part of the, the headdress. It's pretty cool. Um, all I can say right now, Carlo, is shrink your brush. You're ready to shrink your brush even more. So shrink your brush, brush um, get the 100% on, and add more of these um, illuminations on her dress. Because you see how small the brush is for the eyelashes? You need to make that same amount around it. Imagine this. This is a focal point. Focal point means the most details. This is the focal point of this painting. And everything around this focal point needs to be just almost at the same detail level. Not at the exact. This is 100% detail. This should be 80% detail. This should be 70% detail. And then out here should be like 50% detail. Okay, it should be a gradual movement towards the detail, which is of the face. Right here, you've got like 10%. Here, you've got like 5%. Um, you need to start upping the percentage of, on your detail that surrounds the character. Even in the past, even in the last painting that you did, there was a problem with the focal point. It wasn't, um, it was too detailed compared to everything else. So what you need to start doing is increasing the detail. Shrink your brush and start adding, have confidence, don't be afraid. I know you've established these beautiful colors and this beautiful texture, and I know you're scared of breaking it. I know you have that, that, that anxiety, <laughs> but the anxiety is over. You've already gotten such a beautiful painting. All you can do is just add accents to it. And that's pretty much what, what's, what needs to happen. It's already looking so much more alive with these extra details, these extra sparkles. And that's just the smallest bit because you've already done 90% of the piece. This is the last final 10% rendering that you need to start doing. So I'm not sure what this headpiece is because it's really, really abstract. And it's really undefined and that undefined nature of it is distracting. Um, it kind of has, it kind of looks off. So what you can do is get some contrast in there. Maybe it's just deliberately abstract, but it is still a real object. Some sort of floral design that she's placed over her head. What I'm going to be doing is just defining some areas here. So bear with me. Just going with the texture you already established. I'm not taking away anything. Keeping the values the same, because the values you have are pretty good. You just need to up the edges. This is it. This is what it is, Carlo. It's not the lines. We don't need more lines. We don't need any more of these swirly lines. Be careful of those swirly lines. They can make the whole image look two-dimensional, because they're going to look like sketch lines, even though they're strings. What it is, it's it's the edges. You need edges. Okay. So do you see that extra addition of detail? Let me show you the before and after, just from this point. Before, kind of foggy, kind of, you know, unfocused after. Oh, detail. Nice. I like detail. And the viewer is instantly attracted. You need a shadow for her, for her headpiece. For this part of the headdress, right here. Okay. And I recommend because everything else is so much more detailed. Why is the hair? Why is the hair so neglected? You need to add the detail to the hair as well. Maybe add in some of those layers or something. Something going on with the hair because the headdress is more detailed than the hair. Impossible. That shouldn't be happening. 
The hair is part of the head. The head is part of the face. And if the face is the most detailed, so should the hair be. It's still part of the 90% or 80% here, and it's not detailed enough. Let me add some shine to the hair so it looks like hair. Let me just blur it a little bit. It seems a bit contrasty in that area. Don't be afraid of, of um, if this might be a work in progress, you probably already know everything I'm talking about. Um, but don't be afraid of detailing. And just keep working on the hair and layering it. Make sure these these additional pieces are on a different layer because they're going to really break your break your hair flow, the flow, the line of motion for the hair. Okay, some more flyaway hair here. You can also afford to add in some hair for the eyebrows. If you're adding the lashes, the eyebrows are going to also be visible. Remember, it's about relativity. Like it's about comparing one object beside the other, if you have a lash beside an eyebrow, you're going to need to show the hair on the eyebrow because it's the same material, it's the same stuff. It's made of the same stuff. Okay, so you need more of that hair stuff here. For the eyebrows, some eyebrow hairs go down, some go up. Having a good reference helps you know which ones do what. So I'm just drop tooling the outside color of the area outside the eyebrow and I'm brushing it inward to make it seem like there's breaks in the eyebrow. This is a very common technique. Okay, and I'm just going to detail that. Do you see what detailing does, guys? I mean, you have these beautiful... Um, uh, details on the face, pores, you just need to up that, that detail level everywhere else. Remember that detail scope I showed you, 80%, 90%, 100%, remember that. Okay, detail that. And then of course the chin seems to be a bit tucked in. I recommend you make it stick out a little bit more. Sorry if I'm not looking at the comments. I do apologize. I need to get through these um, ASAP. Also, the shadow of the eyes, which I talked about last time. It is the most important thing, like literally. So let me do it on a separate layer to show you. The shadow of the upper eyelid on the white of the eyes. Yes, it casts a shadow. It's that sticky outy. It does stick out that much. You can still have the same highlights of the face, but do you see what happened? Everyone just pay attention to the eyes. Look at the eyes. Before, after. Do you see the instant life that you see embedded into the, into the eyes? They just come to life. It's something about them. It's not about which one's brighter. I think for the trained eye, you know what I'm talking about. Something happens to the eyes where they look a little bit more alive. Okay? Merge that down. Also, don't forget, detail is also about the amount of black you use. Black also adds detail because it means you're, you're focusing even to that point of, of, of contrast between the darks and the lights. So if you add a little bit of, of dark around the eyes, around the nose, and the dark spots here and here, what happens is that the detail and the focus is also heightened. So before all the darks, of course this is your choice. If you want to keep that faded look, you can. So before, after. More contrast, therefore more detail. And if you just keep height, see this, this is your name, right? But you need this. You actually need this amount of detail that your name is bringing into this. So I'm going to take away some of your name and just act like it's part of the shine of the, um, Sorry, Carla. <laughs> of the of the headdress. Okay, you need that same. Get that cursive that you use for your name and use it for over here. 
details there, details here. Shrinking your brush brings you details. Enlarging your brush helps you complete larger areas. Great, greater grayscale value changes. Um, scale of, of uh, uh, what's it called? Cast shadows. All that hullabaloo. So I'm almost done. Three minutes. I'll probably wait, spend an extra five minutes on this. Just to take it home. Okay, using the sharpen tool because I'm sort of short on time. And then bringing in the dodge tool. I know you use the dodge tool, but heightening the contrast in areas of focus adds more focus. I bring in some of that shine. Seems like you use a reference for this. Look at the reference. See what what areas um, are are lit up. She seems like she's got one of those eyes that always look like they're tired, but they're not, which is really pretty. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, but it's kinds of eyes that have that kind of thing, which makes it look more realistic, right? Gives it more of an organic habit. <clears throat> Yeah, mine do as well. <laughs> they always look tired. Shay, are you my twin? <laughs> are you my long lost twin? Okay. <laughs> probably, yeah, probably. <laughs> also, some eyes have a really large um, lip fat on either side of the lip like that. I'm just going to zoom out to make sure I'm doing it right. You might benefit from that slightest little bit and has added an organic nature to the face. And of course the shadow of the head on the neck, which has been neglected so far. You need that shadow. This other area here, this, this outer area, this is all secondary light source, this glow in the background. You can use it to define her chin, her, chin, her cheek, and her neck. Okay. I'll show you the before and after. I know some of you are waiting for it. So you can go. Sorry, it's been taking so long. I just am a perfectionist. I can't not do it. Okay, and then the clash, the secondary light source clash on the cheek. And then just bring that down a touch. Also bring in some of that green on her neck generally just to unify the light source so bringing in that nice glow and then some of that glow around her costume and because the breasts are part of the focal point or part of the 90 percent or 80 or 70 you need to have some contrast there plus you want, if you have if you got boobs you get more faves <laughs> Her eyes also seem like they're hooded, so what happens with hooded eyes is that there's more fat there than normal eyes. So you need to have some light source showing that that is a mountainous area that sticks out. Okie dokie. Some more shine on the hair. And save. And I'll show you the before and after now. Actually, let me get rid of that shine. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so before, it was okay. It was still there. But what happens um, when you uh, detail one area a bit more than the other? So right now, the he the area on the headdress was a bit more detailed than the face, and the and the f the scope of detail wasn't balanced. The face here needs to be the most detailed, and everything else needs to be less detailed as you move out. So I up the contrast on the face, decrease well, by adding darks, 
um, added some contrast in the outer areas. So remember, 100%, 90%, 80%, 70%, and then 50% detail everywhere else. Okay? And if you feel like the contrast on the eyes is too much, you can always just brush over them. For me, that contrast is there. I really like using black. Um, sorry about that. That's the phone. If you guys can even hear that. Um, but if you want, you can decrease that contrast. But I recommend it to still be there. Okay? Yeah, it pops out. Why does it pop out? Because contrast. Contrast makes things pop out. Contrast is the difference between black and white. It pops out because there's no gray area. Duh, because the line is there. Black and white. When things are black and white, it's easy to understand. <laughs> when there's a lot of gray area, which you had before, lots and lots of grays, no real darks to work as an anchor for the, for the form, you had a gray area. Nothing popped out. Some things popped out, which was the details, and the over-detail around the face, except the detail on the face, which it's a portrait, and automatically, number one rule of portraiture, always make sure the face is the most detailed. And then after. Okay? So I'll send this to you. I hope it helped. I'm sorry about those who whose images I can't look at right now because I've run out of time. Okay, so thanks again and have a great day. Bye-bye.